Those of you who follow us on Twitter or Facebook might know that our very own Professor Ed Copeland recently won a prestigious medal from the Institute of Physics. Now we're all really pleased, it was a great excuse to go and have a night out and amazingly see Professor Moriarty in a uh, bow tie, something you don't see every day. Professor Edmund Copeland of the University of Nottingham. But here at 60 Symbols, of course, we're especially happy for Professor Copeland. Now, his win has nothing at all to do with 60 Symbols. He's won it for his own research into three areas. Cosmic strings and superstrings. Inflation. That's not the financial type, of course. We're talking on a cosmic scale here. And dark energy. So we're going to post three videos, one on each area of research. And I've really let Ed off the leash a bit here, so he's going to be talking for quite a while. But I know a lot of you always say you want to hear more from the professors, so here you go. Here's the first of three videos with Ed, and this one is Cosmic Strings and Super Strings. Do you know when uh, they announced the uh, Nobel Prize? And uh, they announced it to Higgs and Anglais, who quite rightly received the prize. And they didn't give it to Kibble, which uh, upset me partly because Tom's a good friend, but also I think he probably deserved it as much as they did. And so I tweeted a few minutes later and I said, uh, you know, congratulations to Higgs and Ongle, fully deserved, but I feel sorry for Tom. And what we now need to do is go and find cosmic strings so that he can get his own Nobel Prize. Because Tom Kibble came up with the idea of cosmic strings. Back in 1976, these wonderful objects, first of all, you need a real imagination to come up with these kind of things. They're related to the Higgs field. They, they, they are made up of what we could call the Higgs field, but just at a completely different energy. So cosmic strings are uh, examples of something called a topological defect. These are objects that formed in the ver may have formed in the very early universe. There's no evidence yet of their existence. And uh, they're incredible, they're amazing objects, and so I'll just try and describe, give you an idea of them. Their, their strings, their thickness is much, much smaller than a proton, okay? So you've no chance of seeing them, but they can be as long as the observable universe. Moreover, if you had about a kilometre of such a string, it would have the mass of the Earth. So they're as th much thinner than a proton, but the, 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 the mass of the objects, or the energy stored in the objects would be, of a kilometre of them would be about that of the Earth. And they, could, they formed, um, these particular ones would have formed within the first 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang. You just need quite an imagination to think about these things. And uh, they formed under phase transitions, just as we've been Hearing about the Higgs field, it undergoes phase transitions and as it, as it undergoes this transition where it changes from one state to another state, it can give masses to the particles. In this particular case, what happens is the, the, the equivalent field, but at a much higher energy, as it changes from one high energy state to another under a phase transition, throughout the universe this doesn't happen all smoothly. And it, there are various parts of the universe where, it, where a bit of the original high energy bit gets trapped. And these are formed the lines, these long strings. So the, the strings are the original high energy bit that was before the phase transition and are surrounded by the new phase, which is at a lower energy. And once they're formed, you have a, you have a network of these long strings crossing across the universe and loops of string. And then, they're, because they're so massive and under so much tension, they begin to flop around. And as they flop around, moving at close to the speed of light, or about half the speed of light, they begin to cross one another. So you imagine a long piece of string, like a shoelace, okay? You imagine a shoelace, and you, as it wraps back and crosses itself, well, with a shoelace, you can't do anything. It just can't go through itself. But with a cosmic string, they can, it can chop off at that point where, where a piece of string crosses itself, then at the junction where they've crossed, it will break. These loops of string now are under a huge tension. Remember, a kilometer is about the mass of the Earth. They're oscillating around, they're moving close to the, you know, a good fraction of the speed of light. And because they're moving and oscillating, they radiate. They radiate gravitational waves 
just like any massive object that moves will radiate gravitational waves. And that's its principal way of losing energy. Because the, if they didn't do that, what would happen is the long strings would just keep stretching as the universe expands. It'd be like pulling an elastic band. And the energy stored in these long strings would get bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, they would come to totally dominate all the other contributions to the energy in the universe, and it would completely change the dynamics of the universe. So that doesn't happen. We've, we've not seen any. So that either they're not there or something else has happened which has meant they don't dominate. And the thing that we think happens is that because these long strings can form loops and these loops can then radiate their energy in gravitational waves, then they can reach what we call a stable scaling solution where the energy stored in the strings becomes a constant fraction of the total energy. So it never comes to dominate. The energy in the strings doesn't disappear, it doesn't grow and become too big, it just becomes it's like the Goldilocks amount of energy, it's just right. And uh, that was what got people very excited when Tom Kibble first came up with this amazing idea of the formation of these objects. He demonstrated that when they evolve under the expansion of the universe, that they would chop off these loops and they would radiate away their energy in, in just the right amount so that the overall energy of this network of strings would be some fixed fraction of the background energy. Now, it turns out you can work out what that fixed fraction is, and, it, and you, you find that for, for um, phase transitions which are, correspond to what we call the grand unified phase transition, that's where we unify the strong, the electroweak and the electromagnetic forces, this is at about 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang, that the energy scale associated with that, which determines the masses of these strings, that is just sufficient to lead to the fluctuations in the matter that produces uh, the cosmic microwave background radiation and the distribution of galaxies. This was what the, it seemed to be the case back in the 1970s and early 1980s that cosmic strings provided a, the seeds from which structures would form. So, people, so now we had uh, a theory which was rivaling another theory called the inflationary universe but they were competing with one another. Unfortunately, <laughs> about the time I started working on these theories, um, the, the evidence from the cosmic microwave background was coming in and it was getting better and better, more accurate. You could, you could see the fluctuations in the temperature of the microwave background and all different sizes across the, across the, the universe, the observable universe. And you could begin to fit your predictions from cosmic strings with what you observed in terms of what this distribution should be. And, you found cosmic, and it was found that cosmic strings just weren't working. They were not matching the observed cosmic microwave background anisotropies. And so people began to lose interest. These wonderful objects that could well have formed in the early universe. And I should say that the analog objects that have been observed in condensed matter systems they're observed in liquid helium systems, they're observed in systems with pneumatic liquid crystals. The scaling properties are all seen and match what you might expect from cosmology. It's just that they've not been seen yet in cosmology. So back in the, at the turn of the, uh, at the end of the 1990s, beginning of the 2000s, people began to lose interest in these objects because they were not doing what they were, it said on the tin. In particular, when you look at the observed map, and look at the um, power in the map as a function, if you like, of the, of the angle of the sky that you're looking at. It's got a very distinctive set of peaks and troughs. They're called the Doppler peaks and troughs. When you compare that with what the prediction is from cosmic strings, basically the cosmic strings would give you one peak and, and not the secondary peaks, not the secondary Doppler peaks. I carried on because I was interested in some other features. Um, there are some, as I mentioned just a few, few minutes ago, there, 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 there are condensed matter systems which demonstrate these. And, and in fact, there are a number of condensed matter systems which are driven by loops of vortices, loops um, of effectively of strings. And, and there's um, a particular thing called the Vinan equation, which, which is used a lot in helium. 
and no one's really been able to derive that equation from first principles and I think there's a way of doing it from the work we did and so that was something I carried on working on and still am thinking about with Tom and Danny Steer. Um, but basically the idea of using strings in cosmology, yeah, we, I stopped thinking about that for a little while and it wasn't until about 2002 when I was, uh, in fact, early 2003, I, I went to a, um, a meeting in Santa Barbara. It was one of the perks of working <laughs> in this field. It, and uh, when I was there, I got chatting to a few people who were, who were thinking about a different type of string. They were thinking about what we might call fundamental strings or the super strings of string theory. Back in the 1980s, people were working on that. And in fact, probably the most brilliant theoretical physicist alive today, Ed Witten, had, had asked the obvious question, if you have cosmic strings and if you have these fundamental strings, maybe they're the same thing. And he'd come to the conclusion they couldn't be. Basically, um, the fundamental string turned out to be very unstable. If you, if so, if you formed a string that was you know, the size of a galaxy, then a fundamental string would just want to chop up incredibly quickly. Um, he also discovered that if you, if you looked at what the natural value was for this mass of the fundamental string, it was way too big compared to what observations were telling you the cosmic string could be. And so there were these reasons why, you know, the instability, the fact that the masses didn't work out, which meant the, th the feeling was they weren't going to work. But in the early 90s, there was a, a kind of a string revolution, a second string revolution, in which it was realized there was a, a new class of objects could form. And these new class of objects, in those new class of objects, these strings could actually be stable. These are, the, these, are these cosmic strings or normal strings? Normal strings. That the normal strings, which we thought were unstable, could be stable, or, or at least live way, way longer than the age of the universe and that they could have a, a tension or a mass per unit length much lower than Witten had thought. And it opened up the possibility that actually maybe these strings could be like the cosmic strings and, what we, and they became known as cosmic superstrings. And so I, I was involved in some work uh, looking at that and that was one of the papers which sort of rejuvenated the subject in that a lot of the string theory people began to get it excited, not least because it had some unusual properties, these cosmic superstrings. They, they could come in different flavours, so that now when, uh, let's call it a, an orange flavour and a yellow flavour, if they came together, they wouldn't simply pass through one another. They, they couldn't because they, they had their various colours and uh, they couldn't simply chop and, go and, and f connect the orange with the yellow. You, they'd have to form a composite in between. So you, you ended up with the position where these strings would no longer form simple loops, but they'd form what you call junctions, three-way junctions. So two strings would come in and they'd, they'd hit each other, and at the point where they'd hit each other, there'd have to be a new bridge would evolve out. And so this led to these more complicated networks, which I and others have, begun, have, been, have been analyzing and thinking about. And we're, and we're looking at the possibility that these objects could actually be seen th not both in the microwave background but also if you remember I said the primary decay route of strings is through gravitational waves. These strings and cosmic strings have some wonderful properties on them. For example when you have a loop of string, and I'm getting to the decay of the strings now and how we might find them. So if you have a loop of string that's oscillating and backwards and forwards then Every now and again, once in an oscillation usually, it will, uh, there'll be a part of the string which forms what's known as a cusp. This cusp is a very kind of a sharp region which goes at the speed of light, instantaneously goes at the speed of light. And because it's so sharp, it's got so much energy packed into this region, it can emit bursts of gravitational waves. And so there are detectors out there, there's the LIGO detector and then they're upgrading it to the advanced LIGO detector, which are searching for these. So these, you would get these beaming events coming out from the strings. And uh, a number of us have been working on the properties of these beaming events and, you know, to, so that to see whether or not they could be detected by 
the, these gravitational wave detectors, and it's one of the main things these gravitational wave detectors will be looking for. The beams of gravity. Beams of gravity, yeah, shooting out from these objects. And they, because they're, 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 they are so sharp, they don't just beam gravitational waves, they can beam other things. They can beam particles out. And so they're just, it's just like the ultimate laser, this going boom. And, it, and the, the neat thing is it's not doing it all the time. It's, it's doing it once a cycle, you know, and it just goes beaming and then beams and then beams. And so you have this sort of pulsing effect that you can begin to look for. It's a distinctive signature. So you have those and then you have other features on these strings which are called kinks. So every time a string chops, chops off and chops a loop off, it leaves this discontinuity where one string has come in and, the, and it's met the other string. And where they've met and, and a, a loop has, has gone off, you're left with this sort of discontinuity, the string, one string here and the other string there. And that then begins to propagate around the configuration. And you just get a build-up of these kinks which also radiate. Uh, and so you get these extra beaming effects from these objects as well. You're just making this stuff up, aren't you? It's just great, isn't it? So one of the things you're trying to do is understand the distribution of these things and then the amount of radiation, the rate at which they'll come off. And of course we've not seen it. <laughs> so this could be the bit that's totally made up. But one way of interpreting something that you don't see isn't that the object's not there. It's telling you about what that mass scale can be. You know, if the, it's just getting lower and lower and lower. If, if the mass scale of the strings was high enough, the tension in the strings was high enough, they'd beam more energetically and we would have seen them. So the fact we haven't seen them, one interpretation is the mass scale is dropping down. And that is... So in fact, they're dropping down so that they're getting difficult to reconcile with grand unified theories, the typical grand unified theories, but then they are consistent with some of these cosmic superstring models. They're, those are still perfectly plausible. If the cosmic microwave background isn't helping the cause at the moment, it isn't matching, they're not finding these gravity lasers, these, these waves, <laughs> you're not finding any of the evidence, and mm. in fact some of the evidence is going against the mm. idea, what makes you keep the faith? Well, no, the first thing is it's such a beautiful idea. The idea of a phase transition is, is well accepted in, in, in particle physics. Um, the Higgs mechanism is a phase transition. And, and, and it, the breaking of a symmetry, which is what is going on here, is, is well accepted. And, and so the, 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 the fact that these objects are seen in equivalent systems, terrestrial systems, is sort of evidence that the, the ideas work. Now, there's no reason why that I'm aware of that this sh shouldn't be allowed to happen in the early universe, but we don't know if it did happen. We know phase transitions happened, or we believe they, they occurred. Whether or not they occurred in such a way that they produced these objects, and there are two more, three more f types of defects, by the way. I should just give them a name check, which is monopoles, domain walls, and textures. These could have all formed, and in fact the monopoles is one of the reasons why people came up with the idea of, of inflation, um, which we'll maybe touch on in a different video. So the, it's the fact, I think, that these things are so, so natural in the sense of phase transitions are expected to have played a major role in the universe, early universe, that makes me think we should be looking for them. And the fact that we don't see them yet, I still interpret as more of a bound on the strings rather than yeah, this is clearly evidence this didn't happen. It may not have happened, and eventually, when it becomes clear that the, the detectors just have no chance of seeing these objects, then I think it's time probably to, to move on. But it, that's not at that stage yet. And in fact, Planck is currently looking at its second year of data, and one of the things that it will be looking for are what is known as polarization effects. That's where the, the, the radiation emitted gets polarised by the presence of objects and cosmic strings can do that, it can polarise the light and so um, there are things called B modes which is a, a particular type of polarised light to do with magnetic fields that uh, cosmic strings will pr they'll produce a particular signal and that's something that I'm working on with regard to both cosmic strings and cosmic superstrings and with people here at Nottingham trying to make a prediction of what that signal should be so that we can see if it's there in the Planck data or not. It probably won't be, but you never know. How long 
abundant are they? Are they are they one of those things where there's a million of them in the room, or are they, are they like these great ribbons in space that you wouldn't want to cut through you because they'll chop you in half? Mm, so that's a really important question, and and and. So the long strings, that there are two types, right? There's the, there's the strings which stretch across the observable universe. There will be of order a dozen, maybe 20, 30, that kind of figure for the, the density of them. Wow. Yes. And, but, the, but the loops of string, uh, there are billions. There are billions. In fact, the majority of the energy in the strings are in loops because these long strings chop themselves up into, into loops. And these loops then gradually decay, but the majority of loops that are formed are chopped off you know, around the size of the observable universe at that time. And then so they take a long time to decay and they're being chopped off all the time. So you've constantly replenishing these loops. They'll, they'll, a whole group will have decayed, but there'll be a whole group still decaying and then a new group beginning. And where are the new ones being chopped off from? From the big th giant thirty? Uh, yeah, from the from from those, and then from the big loops themselves, which are chopping themselves up, and uh, from all of the you know all the other loops will be chopping themselves up all the time. It's not a case of it. It's not the majority of the loops are self intersecting. In other words, they as they evolve, they'll they'll move in such a way. So if this is a loop, um, it will it will move in such a way that at some point in its evolution, it will chop and off will come two more loops. And most of the loops do that. There's a small subclass of them which are called non-self-intersecting, which are able to evolve so as not to chop themselves up and somehow come back out again and then go back and come back out without, without um, um, breaking up. In fact, in the early, this, this is research, in, this is how research goes. When, when strings were first thought of as serious candidates for structures, one of the nicest results that someone came up with, in fact, a guy called Neil Turok came up with, was he, he, he looked at the class of non-self-intersecting loops and he, he realised that they kind of could, could match the distribution of clusters of galaxies. And he got this kind of nice one-to-one -one map between the distribution of these big loops and the distribution of clusters. And that was a very exciting time because people thought, oh, wow, these... You've clearly got evidence here of this, but then we began to realise that actually the string dynamics worked didn't work quite like that, and that that was a kind of a fluke. And uh, actually, the the majority of the loops don't do that at all; they just break up very rapidly. If I was to encounter one of these <coughs> strings, especially one of these big thirty that you've got me really intrigued by, mm. what would happen? I was thinking about that today, and it, it, it wouldn't be a great idea. I think is a fair thing to say because one of the one of the things that strings have they're so massive so they've got this large string tension and if they're moving they will they affect matter moving around it in fact if you were to walk around a, a straight string um, then you might think you go from zero degrees you walk all the way around and you come back to 360 degrees with a straight string that's not quite right the string sort of cuts out a bit of space so when you walk around, it, it makes your space conical. And um, so walking around a string, you might walk around maybe 350 degrees and you've come back to where you've started. And what that effectively means is that trajectories of objects going past a string get bent. So this is one of the ways people think about looking for, looking for strings. You, you look, I'm coming to answer your question, by the way. Um, you get light coming by the strings and will get bent. And then when you trace back that light, it looks like you've got double images. And in fact, one of the distinctive signatures of strings would be not that you get a pair of double images, because that happens all the time, but actually you'd get a line of them, because a string is a line object. And so if, you, if you're lucky, you'll get lots of these lensing. And there have been attempts to, to find such consecutive lensed events and, and they've been found but they've turned out not to be from strings but just to be pure chance. So these things are so massive right and so matter when it goes by it gets gets perturbed it gets shoved in and that's why people thought that, that's a scientific word shoving shoved in that's why people thought strings would be very good for structures because they knew that as a string went past say a distribution of matter such would be the gravitational pull around the string that the matter would clump together and then you've got your, your initial seeds, that you've got your initial fluctuations which would allow other matter to form around it and you get wakes. What I think will happen 
uh, is so when one of the, if one of these strings was to say go through the earth, which is a light going through you, um, what it, because it's you know you're not going to see it <laughs> first of all because it's so infant, it's infinitesimally thin. It's about way I think it's about a trillion times smaller than the size of a hydrogen atom. So it will go straight through, but it's going through about 0.3 or 4 of the speed of light. It's going through pretty, going straight through. But it will do this effect, right? The, it, the matter, the dense material that the Earth is made of, will get shoved in. It'll sort of get attracted behind the string as, a string, as if it's performing a wake behind it. And the argument is uh, that I was, and I was looking at the calculations, that what will actually happen, and in fact they're using this to try and say, Maybe some of the earthquakes on the earth is due to this, okay? This is the kind of imagination you need. Um, so the string goes through, the dense matter that's making up the earth gets um, attracted in behind the string, so, and then it begins to bounce. It gets oscillates like this. And the, they're saying it could, it could cause these, the ripples that you see as surface waves that lead to earthquakes. For you and I, it would probably have a bit more, maybe, what I can't figure, figure out is whether or not it's going to sort of tear us apart or whether we're just going to sort of feel you know pretty unpleasant for a few minutes and then we carry on. You talk about them like they're real. Yeah I do a bit. <laughs> it's a bit sad. Are they real in your head? Yeah in my head I, I happily will um, think about them evolving, um, chopping up, I'll happily think about how they might form, how I might test for them. I spend a lot of time trying to because they're fantastic. If they're there the, the goal at the end is fantastic, right? If they're there, either as cosmic strings or as cosmic superstrings, I mean, you have a probe, a unique probe of the very earliest moments of the universe uh, that we just can't get to without this kind of thing. So I think the goal at the end of it is worth it. And the, the theory behind it is so beautiful. I mean, what, I don't know how Kibble did it. I mean, he's, he is one hell of a guy. He just... He, he comes up with a Higgs mechanism and then he just thinks, oh, well, now I'll move on and I'll just discover topological defects. It, it, it's just remarkable that he was able to do this. And, uh, and they, they have driven so much research, the whole idea of these defects. And, and if we do see them, then it really will be a, an amazing um, result for the understanding of the early universe. I think I'd be disappointed if we don't see them, but I, you know, it's certainly not the end of the world. And I, if they're not there, and, and it's, it's, you know, it's, there's no evidence for them, um, yet I'm very happy to think about them and work on them. Um, I, I'll feel I've done some really fun stuff, just trying to understand objects that had every right to be there. There was no reason why they shouldn't be there in the sense of the dynamics with, with which we think of them forming. The, the process which we think of them forming makes complete sense. It's, it's just that the, 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 the particulars of, by which they would have formed didn't happen. That's just unlucky. Uh, and, and yet the mathematics that we've developed in understanding them and um, the, the physical intuition we've, we've developed, I think will, has probably played a role in other things that I've been working on and other people have been working on. No, I'm, if, if they're not there, they're not there, and I, I'm not going to lose sleep. The very first thing I worked on for my PhD were called Kaluza Klein theories. I worked on a subject called Candelis Weinberg, which everyone got very excited about as being a way of unifying the forces, and it didn't work. So I'm, <laughs> maybe people should take note of what I'm working on and then move on to something else quickly. <laughs> Just a reminder, those other two interviews with Ed about inflation and dark energy will be coming very soon. And congratulations again on the medal. Brilliant.